Good? Okay. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we are in verse 14. I want to say it's good to be back before a live studio audience. Last week was, uh, I was glad for the vacation, uh, but I'll tell you what, it was uh, very different to preach to a, just like one person in the crowd. And especially um, when that one person was, well, I don't have a problem preaching to my wife, but um, it was different when it was like 11 o'clock at night on Thursday before we left on vacation. It was just different. But I'm glad that it was, uh, it was still good. Um, we were able to listen to it with my folks uh, back in Nebraska, and so what a wonderful time it was of rest and relaxation. And so, well, we're back at it again, and we're going to talk about the responsibilities of the pastor. And um, Paul is making a switch from talking about how to handle sufferings to how to handle the issue of false teachers. And the greatest way that he does it is to remind Timothy of his responsibility in handling um, false teachers. I also think of it another way, also dealing with the issue of uh, trials and tribulations. When you're going through trials and tribulations, it's always good to be reminded of all the things you need to do. Because it's so easy, amen, to get so focused on the trials that we forget to focus on what we are called to do. And so Paul reminds Timothy that he has to stay at the task. He has to stay at the matter at hand. And he has to not let his concentration lapse. And so he begins by giving him some exhortations on uh, how to handle himself, especially in the arena of dealing with false teachers. What I want to do is I'm only going to cover two verses this morning. Um, I don't think we're going to get very far past that uh, because there's just so much in these little verses that we need to talk about. But when we look at this issue of false teachers and we look at the responsibility of pastors, there's uh, several things we can look at. We're going to look at uh, uh, six of them, but we're only going to look at three of them uh, this morning. The first thing that Paul tells Timothy that he needs to do is he needs to remind the people of the great spiritual truths. He says in verse 14, keep reminding them of these things. I'm going to stop there. You know, Pastors oftentimes get a hard rap. I've been in ministry for a long time. And um, there are times when people have come up to the pastor and say, Pastor, you've preached that sermon before. And I always respond this way. I says, I'm surprised you remember it because I don't. Uh, usually I don't even remember what I preached on like a month ago. And so if I find myself repeating, uh, that's probably because I need to be reminded of it again, and so do you. We live in a world today that we easily forget things. Amen? How many of you forget things? I do. I, I forget what day of the week it is sometimes. Sometimes I forget where I've placed certain items. I don't know how many times growing up that I've lost my car keys. I've lost library books. I remember growing up, I, I, I'm not a, oh, I love to read, but I, I have a hard time reading without audio books. And so I would check out audio books all the time. And they would come in big old things of cassette tapes, right? And they would come in like eight cassette tapes. And for some reason or another, I'd always find out that I would lose one of them, right? And I would go and I would search my whole room trying to find that one stupid cassette tape, right? And you look all over the place. 
And then you get so frustrated that you go and do something else and then you come back and you're not even looking for it and you find it. And you say, well, I thought it was already there. Right? But we all need to be reminded from time to time. Life is difficult. Life is tough. And it's easy to forget. I know for myself personally, it's easy to forget. Especially when we are going through trials and tribulations. And what I mean by that is when we go through trials and tribulations, it's easy to forget things. Or when you're on a, or when you're on a spotlight, it's easy to forget things. I don't know how many times I get up here and I have all my sermon all organized in my mind and I get up here and I get some timers. Right? I get up here and I can't even remember what I was going to say. One example of that is um, when I've gone through hardship, I always love to quote um, Philippians 4, 3. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God. And I remember one time someone asked me, well, what do you use to help you through difficult times? For the life of me, I could not recall that verse. You need to be reminded. The Bible tells us, or Paul tells Timothy, he says, keep reminding them of these things. What are these things? It's everything that we've been talking about in chapter 2. It is the faithful saying. It is the fact of keeping your eyes on Jesus in the midst of trials and tribulations. And it's all about Jesus and all the stuff we've been talking about. He says, keep reminding them of these things. So part of my job as the pastor is to remind you of things you've already know. So if we happen to go through a, a series that I've done before, uh, just smile and bear with it because you may learn something again the second time that you didn't learn the first time. The Apostle Peter also talks about these things in 2 Peter chapter 1 when he talks about the importance of reminding. Peter says in 2 Peter 1 verse 12, he says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. Don't get mad at your pastor when he repeats. Or when he re-emphasizes things that are important. Why? Because... I always want you to remember the important things. You see, false teachers love to talk about things that are not important. And so as pastors, it's important that we remind you of the things that are important. And I love what, what Peter says back there. Where he says, even though you already know it, and already are established in them. I'm here to refresh your memory. I read an article about a pastor who had been at a church for over 40 years. And they asked him if he ever wanted to go to a new church. Because oftentimes after you go to a church for about 20 years, you run out of material, right? And you usually, what happens is a lot of pastors will go from church to church to church because they run out of new material, and so they don't want to rehash the old material to the people, and so they just move on to another church and they rehash their material there. And they ask this guy, why, why don't you go to another church? He says, because I have a responsibility to remind my people of what they already know. Keep reminding them of these things.
I don't know about you, but I always need to be reminded. I've read the Bible how many times? And every time I read, I always read something that I never really quite picked out before. And you kind of go, wow, I, I don't remember reading it last time. But I'm sure glad I read it this time. Same thing is with pastors and preaching. So if I've gone through a series before or I've repeated a sermon before, it's probably because, number one, I need to be reminded of it. And number two, probably because you need to be reminded of it. So it's okay. The second thing that he tells uh, pastors to do is he says, warn them against petty arguments. False teachers love to come in and stir up trouble about things that make no sense. And Paul says here, he says, warn them before God against quarreling about words. That's pretty harsh language, is it not? Not only does he say to warn them, but he says to warn them before God. You know, pastors also get a hard rap because they come and they get told, and I've had this happen not here, but I've been told that I've been too offensive when I preach. I had one guy tell me one time, he says, you make me uncomfortable. And I responded, good, that probably means you need to fix something in your life. Because usually when I need something fixed in my life and someone speaks truth to me, I feel pretty uncomfortable. And sometimes the pastor has the hard task of warning people before God. See, False teachers are so important to avoid that Paul says, warn them before God. I have a very important job that I have to perform. So if you think that I'm offending you by warning you or to say, stay away from this or stay away from that, you've got to remember that I don't answer to you, I answer to God. And I answer to the Bible. And I don't mean to sound snobbish. But that's how sacred I hold my position. That I would rather be wrong before you than wrong before God. And I'd rather take my chances with Him than with men. But he says, warn them before God against quarreling about words. This, this word quarreling it can either be strife, it can be, one translation uses the word wrangling with words, wrestling with words. The idea here is, is things that, that we fight about. Arguments. What, what sort of arguments can happen in the church that can lead to division and lead, ultimately to, to people leaving? Things that are not essential to the gospel. I mean, I can give you a list of them. Unfortunately, I've, I've seen people that have split the church over the color of the carpet. Been in, I've, I've heard about board meetings that were heated over one person wanted red, another person wanted blue, one person wanted purple and pink or whatever. Those are not the hills to die on, my friend. He says, warn them to stay away or warn them against quarreling about words. Whether that is about things that are trivial like that or even about things about the Bible. You know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a hot topic. Speaking in tongues is one of them. You know, some people think it's absolutely necessary to do. Other people, not so much. Again, I go back to what Phineas F. Brzee said. That really hit me at pastor's retreat wife. Phineas Brzee says, preach Jesus. Nothing to the right, nothing to the left, Jesus only. <clears throat> Can't go wrong with Jesus. Can't go wrong with Jesus. 
But when we start talking about other things, here's another one. When was Jesus going to come back? Is he going to come back before the, ra- or before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, or at the end of the tribulation? Here's how bad that conversation got one time. This is quarreling about words. I, I had a friend, his name was Dwight. I, love him to, I loved him to death. He was an older gentleman that used to use the computers at the Bible college. and <clears throat> We got into a conversation one time about end time prophecy and whether or not the rapture is going to come before the tribulation or in the middle or in the end. And every, every person has their commentary on it. And you can have biblical support for all three of them. Uh, if you want my opinion, I'm a pan. Jesus will come back when he comes back, and I'm I'm on that ticket whenever he's on it. So I, I don't pick a I don't pick a side because I have no clue. Anyway, he was very much a post trib person. So much so that he believed that if you did not believe in a post trib view, you weren't saved. And the very first thing that he'd go around and ask Bible college students were, what is your position on the rapture? And whatever position they took, if it wasn't his position, he says, you're not saved. I saw so much fighting, and I I tried really hard not to fight with him, because, you know what, yeah, it could be that way, I don't, you know, I don't know. But he would spend time where he would lose friends to the point. Here's the thing, friends. He lost so many people that we even had to depart ways over it. To the point where he quit talking to me. And we didn't see him around the Bible college for a month. Found out that he had died. And nobody found him for a month in his home. Found that he died in his recliner and he was decomposed for a month. Yeah, it stunk in there pretty bad. He died alone and nobody even checked to bother. Why? Because he had driven people away by dying on a hill that didn't need to be died on. Paul tells Christians, he says, if we're to be fighting against false teachers, we have to be on a united front. We can't be bickering with one another about petty arguments. Paul says there's two things for this. Number one is worthless. Or it has no value. It is of no value. Meaning that it is empty. Quarreling, what does it do? Nothing. If you're set in your ways and the guy is set in your ways, it is not going to accomplish anything other than make you mad. I've had a lot of conversations with people that I've tried. I've learned the hard way. I've almost come to blows with good Christian people over stupid things. Because you want to die on that hill and prove your point. It has no value. You're not going to win him. He's not going to win you. So just don't even go there. It has no value, number one. And number two, it only ruins those who listen. Take my friend Dwight. It ruined our relationship. It ruined the relationship that he had with other people. And not only did it ruin those, but it can also ruin those who hear you argue. Right? Those who listen. Does not mean just you and the person you're arguing against, but if you're doing that in a Bible study, or if you're doing that in a class, I used to remember there was a guy in um, in our Bible in our class at school, who would always argue with the professor. Everything he did, he argued with him, and he would go on and on and on. And I finally got tired of it. And I I went to the professor. And I said, "We're going to have a meeting with the. I'm going to have your back." I went to the to the head of the to the president with my professor. I said, "I did not pay three thousand dollars to take inter- to take." Uh, um, Christian ethics to hear this guy argue against my professor. They had him removed 
because he was not doing right. Now, there's nothing wrong to ask questions, but to purposefully argue, and he would do it on purpose. He would do things to where it would become, the professor was trying to get through lecture notes that we weren't able to get through, and we were getting behind because this guy would start, he would play devil's advocate on things and do things that were not good. There were three people in our class that left the Bible college because of that. Because they got fed up with that. And they says, I'm not paying $3,000 to listen to these two people argue. Don't argue. False teachers, people that come into the church and wanted to split the church and do all this, they love to argue. They love to, to argue about things. And I don't, I don't get into that. You know, if it's an honest question, that's one thing. But if you're here just to argue with me, I don't do that. The second thing that Paul says that we're to do, or the third thing he says, is strive to become an approved workman before God. Now he's talking here about the, the minister, that he's to be, if we want to battle against false teachers, and we need to spend time in the word. He uses the verse here in verse 15. He says, Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now what does that mean? Well, the King James uses it, and I used to remember this because it was easy. Stop. And they used to use that as all of the things. Do your homework. But you know, the more I thought about it, you know, this is not just for preachers. But this is for everybody. You know, there's a lot of people that are sitting in the pews today. Not, I don't know about here, but there's a lot of people that don't know the difference between true teaching and false teaching. I remember I got an email one time from someone that says, how do I tell the difference between a pastor who is teaching the word of God and someone who is teaching false doctrine? How do I tell the difference? Study your Bible. Study to show yourself approved. Here it says in the NIV, do your best. The New King James and the NSAB uses the word be diligent. That means to apply yourself. It means to put in the extra work. If, if all of your Bible study and all of your Bible activity is only on Sunday morning, then you're going to be acceptable to any kind of wind of doctrine because you're not going to have any other source of study other than that. And here's what i got to tell you. you got to apply yourself. Just like I have to apply myself. Once I graduated from the Bible college, doesn't mean that I stopped studying the Bible. I still have to be diligent to, to approve myself to God, and so should you. I don't think that should be just for ministers. I think that should be for everybody. We all have to study. We all have to get into the Word. We all have to, to, to be able to distinguish between false and, and true teachers of the Bible. Do your best. Be diligent. Make an effort. To what? To present yourself to God as one approved. To say, hey, I've done the research. I've done the homework. A workman, now I don't think that just means for a pastor, but the workman could be anybody. A workman of the, a laborer in the vineyard who does not need to be ashamed. Now what does that mean? It means one who doesn't get his, uh, the, the, the idea is not getting caught with your pants down. It means you know what you believe. And someone comes up to you and, and what it means is you've studied enough that when you make a statement and someone says prove it, you're able to do so. And not go, well, I'm, 
I just heard that somewhere. You're able to prove it. Not being ashamed. Having the, having the, the information to back up what you believe. That's why I think so many times when I preach, I have so many scriptures that back up my point. I want to show you that, that what I believe is just not my own ideas, but it's from the Bible. So not being ashamed. And then he adds this. Who correctly handles the word of truth. Another translation says to accurately handle the word of truth. You want, to be a, you want to be a good steward of the Bible? You want to be a good steward of God? You spend time studying the Word of God. It reminds me of a story of a, of a young man that wanted to be a fish expert. He got his undergraduate degree in biology. And he told his, his advisor that he wanted to be a fish expert. So... Um, his advice area where he had his, you know, how they have all their little specimens and stuff. And he says, I want you to pick this particular fish from the shelf here and pulled it down. And he says, I want you to tell me everything you can tell me about this fish. So he looked at it for a few moments and told him everything he could possibly see about this fish. And he told him and the professor says, oh, that's not good enough. I want you to take this fish home and I want you to spend the weekend and I want you to write down everything that you can think of. So the guy, he took the fish home and he looked at it and came back the ne next Monday and showed him the list. The professor looked at the list and says, um, not good enough. So what I want you to do is I want you to take this fish for the next six months and I want you to clean it every day. I want you to take it out of the formaldehyde. I want you to change the formaldehyde and I want you to clean it. I want you to take these little Q-tips and I want you to clean it. And while you're cleaning it, I want you to make every observation you can. Write down everything you can tell me about this fish. It's anatomy, it's things that looks different, the colors, the anything you can. So for the next six months, that's all he did. He changed the formaldehyde and he cleaned it and he wrote down everything he possibly could on it. Six months came along and he says, mm, we'll see professor handed him his notebook and says okay we'll see put puts the fish back up there six months later the man was taking a class with this professor and he was talking about a fish that was similar to the one that the man had studied and he says can somebody here and he says uh, can you tell me he pointed to the guy can you tell me the difference between this fish and and the, this fish over here, the one that he had studied. And he was able to tell him exactly the differences between the two fish without looking at the fish that was just presented. Why? Because he had known this other fish so well. He knew it inside and out and up and down and sideways and long ways and back ways and forward ways. He knew it inside out that he could tell you the difference in that fish between that fish because he knew his fish so well. The same thing is about the Word of God. That we should know the Bible so well, inside and out and up and back, that we can immediately be able to spot false teaching at a moment's notice. But we don't. Why? Because we don't spend time reading the Word. We get busy. We get tired. How many times do you always plan to read your Bible and then you get busy? Yes, I do. Sometimes. And then how many times do you sit down and read your Bible and you get overly drowsy? Right? I don't know how many times I've opened my Bible and it's like the Bible, my body thinks, oh, open Bible, sleepy time! Right? You open your Bible and it's just like nap time! It's like an instinct, right? I call that a trigger of Satan. Satan knows if you study it, so he'll make you sleepy. How do we combat false teaching? We got to know this Bible. Study to show yourself approved. Be diligent to present yourself 
to God as one approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed. Who correctly handles the word of truth. And I don't believe that's just for any minister, but I believe that's for every person who wants to be a follower of Jesus. So let me ask you this morning. Do you get mad when someone reminds you of things? Do you get mad when they say, hey, just want to remind you, you know, I, I need you, you know, have you ever had a boss that says, I, I just want to remind you, you, you have this thing I need you to turn in on Monday. They don't do it because they hate you. They do it because they love you. And they, they don't want you to, um, to, to miss it. I oftentimes think of it this way as well. Um, that what may not be important to you may be important to that person who is reminding you. I, I think of it this way. Um, I think of uh, the illustration of an accountant who has the responsibility to pay his employees And let's say that he gets so busy with all the things of life that he forgets to pay his employees. And his employee comes to them and he says, um, excuse me, you, you forgot to pay us. And then the guy gets all mad at the guy and uh, forget That what he's reminding you of is something that's very important to that person. That employee might be counting on that paycheck to pay a bill. What are we reminding you of? Salvation. To me, that's very important. And I'm reminding you because it should be important to you as well. And number two, how good are you at avoiding arguments with people? And are you worried about not only the argument that you get in, but what about those who listen? One of the lessons that I've learned in the Bible college, and I take this today, is I'm very careful of who listens to the conversations that we have. You know, there are people that are listening to the conversations you have with other people. And if all you're doing is arguing about things in the church, whether one is right or one is wrong, the Bible says that it can ruin the lives who listen. And then finally, are we taking the time to study the Word of God, that when presented with false doctrine, are we able to say, you know what, I can tell you the difference between true doctrine and false doctrine. Not because I know false doctrine, but because I know the truth. I know the truth so well that I'm able to spot false doctrine anywhere I can. As a pastor, it's my job to do these things for you. It's my job to remind you of the things that are important. It's my job to tell you don't argue with people because you're going to hurt those who listen to you argue. And it's my job to tell you to study your Bible. Growing up, I used to watch a lot of PBS. 
And one of the shows that I used to watch is Reading Rainbow. And one of the things that he would always tell you at the end of the show is he says, um, you know, this book is great, but don't take my word for it. And that's what I tell you. Never take my word for it. Always study it for yourself. The Bible tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Now that does not mean that we're saved by our works, but what it means is that we are to that we're to study, that we're to figure things out. God gave us a brain, praise the Lord, to be able to think and to be able to problem solve. I can't spoon feed everything. (laughs) But what I can do is I can introduce you to this book. I can introduce you to this person called Jesus. And I hope that I can inspire you and remind you to the point where you want to study it for yourself. But like LeVar Burton says, don't take my word for it. Study it yourself. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for reminding Timothy to remind the people continually. Remind them of the things that are important because it may not be important to the people that are listening, but it needs to be. Father, help us to not argue about stupid things. Father, we get so caught up in the argument and winning the battle and winning the war and we forget that sometimes that this argument not only hurts ourselves, but it can hurt those that listen to our message. Father, may we talk about things that are edifying and uplifting and are encouraging and are strengthening and not that are dividing and cutting and hurtful. Then, Father, help us to have the strength, Father, to study your word. Help us not to take the word of someone who is teaching us, but, Father, help us to take what they're teaching us and to study it and go deeper and further and learn more about you through it. Help us to be like the fish expert that we know our Bible so well that we can spot any kind of false doctrine because we know your truth so well. We pray for your help in these things. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.